you so much, everyone who's joining us in person as well as online. Um, this is a great introduction. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for sort of um, making an exception today to let me sort of speak a bit about the book. So, of course, you're not wrong. There is a book, Passionate Politics, that was released last year. And Audacious Hope, in some ways, draws on lessons from, from that work. So let me just uh, say something uh, about both works together and talk a little bit about how much emotions matter to politics. Because in a lot of the work on politics, uh, the tendency is to assume that the only thing that matters to people are their interests. And I think this, this focus on interests is useful and of course, people, people are self-interested human beings. But the idea of interest itself is something that is often too limited and too restricted to think about only self-maximizing, profit-maximizing behavior. I will do something that is in my interest, where interest means I get benefits and you get losses, right? Whereas... People like Amartya Sen have showed us that interests, even self-focused interests, can be much more than just making profits for yourself and harming others. Yeah, Interests can be collective. Interests are also subjectively defined. Interests are very closely linked to emotions, to feelings, to passions. And therefore, to think about politics as interests only in terms of I, me, myself, and nobody else matters is a bit limited. Um, this doesn't mean politics is all about passions, all about, you know, uh, sort of feelings, emotions, but the two are very closely linked. And passionate politics emerged, the previous book, the one that you mentioned, emerged out of this conversation across disciplines with anthropologists, sociologists, geographers, uh, and of course, political scientists, uh, about uh, how we can think in terms of politics, that is how we can think about interests that is not only about yourself and not only about you know, individual uh, profit. How do people think about their interests through subjective ideas, uh, through uh, emotions, uh, you know, how do, how do ideas uh, of collective well-being matter? Uh, how does, how do hopes, angers, sadness, joy, how do these things play in to the understanding of politics, to behaviors of politics? So when we, when we, when we sort of worked out passionate politics, you know, there were lots of uh, passions that opened up, of course, and, you know, uh, that was in the very specific context of the 2019 general elections, where, as we know, there was a great deal of uh, interests and emotions that sort of, you know, came together, you know, there, there was a lot of um, combining of different uh, kinds of uh, tendencies, if you will, that, uh, you, you know, uh, motivated voters. Now, no election is ever only about interests, uh, whether in India or abroad or anywhere else, uh, a whole range of factors motivate people to vote in certain ways. Um, think about something like Britain's Brexit vote, where Britons sort of voted to leave the EU. Uh, some of it was their own interests, some of it was interests uninterpreted in passionate ways, so that people were not really sort of you know, or necessarily thinking about thinking only about their, their own interests, but what they thought would be for the collective good. So none of this is unique to India. Uh, none of this is unique to elections in India. But of course, we had to focus on a case, and that's exactly what we did in the twenty in the in the passionate politics volume. But that got me to sort of think about passions and emotions and feelings in more specific ways. And one of the interesting uh, sort of ways to think about the role of emotions, the role of non-interest, if you will, uh, was the idea of hope. 
And that really got me to think about this book, the, uh, the, the, the book that uh, is here before you, Audacious Hope. Um, now, why Audacious Hope and why hope in the first place? Um, so I, I am in the politics department, as you mentioned, and one of the key things that we sort of grapple with in the politics department is the question of democracy and what is happening to democracy worldwide. We understand that democracy is under challenge, under stress. There's a lot of uh, uh, sort of erosion of democratic practices and values. There's polarization. Some of it happens on the right. Some of it happens on the left. You know, so there's a great deal of pressure on democracy from both sides. But at the same time, uh, there are lots of people who are working together to push back against these pressures on democracy. There are lots of people who are defending their democracy. Uh, we may agree with them, we may disagree with them, we may think their methods are too radical, not radical at all, etc. But there are lots of people who are doing things to uh, protect and defend the idea of democracy. And I think in that way, the, the idea of audacious hope was really born out of that understanding that uh, it's not all about crisis. It's not all about democratic backsliding. I'm not saying that democratic backsliding is a figment of people's imagination. I'm not saying that at all. There are very serious pressures on democracy. There are very serious stresses on democracy. But people are not just sitting back, you know, letting their democracy uh, die out. Uh, whether in India, whether in Brazil, whether in the Philippines, South Africa, the United States, you know, there are very, very serious ways in which people are trying to protect their democracy. And so that's where the idea of hope as something that people just not only think, but also do, uh, motivated by emotions of, you know, collective care, uh, of uh, sometimes uh, motivated by emotions of patriotism, of social justice. Uh, so there are ideas, there are emotions that come together in order to get people to really think about defending their uh, democracy. Now, in the academic literature on democratic backsliding uh, and the resistance to democrat the democratic backsliding, there are three general views that are presented. The first view in the academic literature is that democratic backsliding is resisted by institutional actors. So if a certain leader or a politician is trying to become too powerful, then other institutions will act as checks and balances. Uh, the legislature could be a check, the bureaucracy could be a check, the judiciary could be a check. So there are institutional checks and balances that kick in to prevent and resist democratic backsliding. A second uh, focus in the academic literature is to look at political resistance to backsliding. So you have politicians who are trying to you know, become powerful, but to push back against that, you have their political opponents. These could be opposition political parties. These could be factions within the ruling party. These could be factions in other opposition parties which make alliances, you know, that are a little, uh, you know, circumstantial and that are very sort of contingent. Uh, but there are political parties that sort of come together to resist democracy, uh, democratic backsliding. And the third set of actors that the academic literature talks about is what we would call the social actors who resist uh, uh, democratic backsliding social actors who try and defend uh, democracy. These are actors in civil society, think tanks, uh, labor unions, uh, you know, rural people sort of associations. Those could be labor unions, farmers movements, etc. So associations in society that come together to defend democracy. So there are these three different sort of uh, strands in the academic literature that focus on how democratic backsliding can be resisted. And this book focuses on the last set of actors, the social actors. Not so much the institutional actors, not so much the political actors, because while they are, you know, they happen, there's a lot that has been written on them. You hear about 
you know, what the opposition political parties are doing. You hear about that all the time. And sometimes they're not doing a great, a very good job, as we all know. Uh, institutions are well known, you know, what the Chief Justice said today or what the Chief Justice said yesterday, uh, you know, and uh, what the bureaucracy did or didn't do. Those are, those are well covered. But it's these social sort of actors who defend democracy uh, that I was interested in. And that's where the idea of hope becomes most sort of uh, obvious and clear cut. Because, you know, when you think about hope, uh, of course, one can think about hope as, you know, you're hoping for a miracle to happen, for instance. But hope is not just hoping for something to happen. Hope is also about what when you do something, when you overcome all odds and you say, okay, I'm not going to let X, Y, and Z situation go up. Yeah. I'm going to take a stance. I'm going to take action uh, and action within the bounds of the law, obviously. Uh, I'm going to work within whatever we have in order to make sure that our democracy is uh, defended. So that's, that's where the idea of audacious hope came to think about uh, the feelings people have, the emotions they have, and the way in which they're able to work together collectively in order to put those feelings into action. Now, I've talked so much so far about democracy as if we all assume and understand clearly what democracy is. But democracy is uh, what some people call a very hotly contested concept itself. What democracy itself is, is often not understood or uh, accepted equally. And so I think it's important to be clear about what what how how we understand democracy in the context of this book as well as in the context of the previous work that you uh, mentioned so uh, of course democracy is about elections uh, regular routine free and fair elections i think that's uh, fairly clear clear cut it's about institutional checks and balances you know the usual division between the legislature the executive and the judiciary that's fairly straightforward but democracy is also a social process and I think sometimes in our understandings or conversations on democracy, the social aspect of democracy gets ignored. Yeah. So the fact that people in a democracy are treated as equals, or at least expect to be treated as equals, there is something as the rule of law where everyone is treated as equal before the eyes of the law, um, where you treat political adversaries with respect. So even though you defeat them in elections, but you know you treat them with respect, you treat them as people whose uh, opinions uh, matter, and of course you uh, you know offer dignity to people, you respect people, ordinary people, even if they have no voice uh, per se, you know, and they may be economically or socially very backward or you know down below, but you treat them all with respect. And of course, most importantly, democracy welcomes rather than stifles dissent. The ability to disagree, the ability to stand out and say, I think what is going on is wrong, and yet be respected for that. So, you know, democracy is about welcoming, not stifling dissent. So, all of these uh, understandings of democracy are important to think about the notion of hope and the notion of emotions more broadly in politics, you know, uh, because all of these matter. And the moment we talk about emotions in politics uh, and we think about uh, democratic politics, not only about people going and putting their vote in those five, you know, once every five or four or six years, depending on the country, but what happens in between those electoral cycles. And then you think about what is it that makes a polity a true democracy? Uh, it's these practices that are motivated by varieties of emotions. And the one that I'm focusing on today, of course, is uh, around hope. But of course, you can have, and this is not to say that anger does not matter in, a, in, in politics. And uh, perhaps nowadays we see too much of a focus on anger. Um, and sometimes anger is good and constructive because when you're angry about injustice or inequality, it's a good thing. What you do with it is a different matter, but it has to be challenged, uh, channeled constructively. 
Uh, joy is another great sort of emotion that can be uh, mobilized uh, and that is often mobilized, uh, either ruling governments or opposition parties. You know, the joy of being a proud, you know, member of uh, India or Russia or, uh, you know, Pakistan or wherever, you know, of, you're a member of a political community. So the joy that comes as part of being in that political community and that can translate into uh, votes. Um, care, the feeling that you have cared for by the government. Uh, and that could be through welfare projects, for instance. It could be through infrastructure projects. You know, you have roads that will connect point A to point B uh, and people get from point A to point B in two hours instead of 20. You know, makes you feel, of course, joy at the infrastructure itself, but that somebody, the government usually, has cared for your doing this. Um, China is a great player at care, you know, using care as a way of uh, conveying to people that, uh, you know, the Chinese care for them, but of course they don't have elections, so we don't quite know how that translates into electoral politics, but the, the motive of care is something that plays up uh, a lot. We have evidence that within the Indian context in 2019, there were a lot of uh, rural poor women, for instance, who really found that the Ujwala schemes, uh, you know, they, they really they really loved it and they felt cared for by the state. And there is mixed bag of evidence to suggest that many people voted, many rural poor women voted for the government because of the welfare program. Now you could say, of course, well, that's a straightforward interest, you know, you get a certain good and you vote. But it's not always that. I mean, if it was a straightforward interest, then uh, you know, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Program that was running across the country uh, in 2014 would have, uh, you know, got the Congress party back to power. But I don't know how many of you remember that campaign, but there was a point at which uh, the uh, Congress party chief said how they had lifted millions of people out of poverty and used his hands in this way. And whatever may have the Congress party may have done, and there's very little doubt that the Congress party's 10 years lifted about, between 2004 and 2014, lifted about 300 or million people out of poverty. But if you don't treat them with respect and you sort of use, you know, hand gestures to make it out like you've done a big favor, that is where the emotions kick in. That's where it's not only about interest, it's about how interests and emotions sort of align together and intersect together. And that's why one has to think beyond interest. If you think only about interest, link it up with economic policy or outcomes, social policy or outcomes, then you only have half, you know, a slice of, of things. Um, so coming back to the, uh, to the present, so looking at uh, hope therefore was a very interesting and useful way for me to think about politics in India at the present moment, where of course there is a great deal of polarized opinion about the uh, present government. Um, and there are lots of worries about how, you know, democracy in India as elsewhere is under threat. Um, but one of, if you think about democracy as a social process, uh, and if you think about the ways in which people themselves sort of uh, are, uh, you know, working together with each other uh, to defend democracy understood in these broad terms, in these social terms, as equal respect and dignity for all, as about welcoming dissent rather than stifling it. The social actors in this country, uh, ranging from anti-caste movements to student uh, protesters, to farmers' movements, characters we may find are, you know, inconveniencing us because they come out on the streets and block the streets and not let us travel around, etc. But they're actually doing a big favor to democracy in this country. We may not like their methods, we may not like their demands. Some of their demands may plainly be wrong or ill-informed, but what they demand is for them to be consulted. To, for them to be listened to. Uh, the farmers' uh, laws are a great example. I think there's lots of very sensible economists, not right-wing or left-wing, but sensible economists who say, 
it makes sense to liberalize agriculture in a country like ours. Yeah. Um, and the government may well have found that that's a good, solid policy to put forward. But you can't bulldoze your way through a policy like that across constituencies who are not convinced. In a democracy, you have to work with everyone and take them all together. Um, and by protesting those laws, the farmers reminded us that, uh, you know, they, they exist. Of course, they were the largest farmers, not the poorest farmers. We know that story. Uh, there's all the story about how their tractors and AC and all of that. That's fine. I mean, farmers are allowed to be rich, right? They, they don't all have to be always poor farmers. Just like the stereotype of the poor Indian is a misplaced stereotype. The stereotype of a poor farmer is also a misplaced stereotype. But by reminding us that they exist and that they need to be consulted before we sort of... Um, take things forward, I think was a, was, a, was, was a very welcome lesson in democracy. So the way the book is organized, therefore, takes you through each of these movements um, and reminds us how uh, by, um, by strengthening dissent, um, despite the government's not sort of inability to be really, or, or unwillingness to be really sort of, uh, uh, you know, listen to them. Uh, you know, they, they were still uh, you know insistent that uh, uh, people sit up and take notice. Um, and I think that's where uh, th th this is a very welcome lesson in democratic politics uh, that we we were told, uh, and the idea of hope therefore works uh, in that sense. One could write a similar book around joy, around anger, around. Uh, fear for that matter, you know, any of these emotions and how you could work with politics and different aspects of politics. Uh, but, the, you know, there's only so much that a book can do. And so I sort of wanted to focus on that. I think I'll stop there. And if there are any further questions that you have or any other, you know, ideas that you'd like to sound out to me, thank you. Uh, thank you. So thank you for explaining the book and what is there <clears throat> in brief and quite also in detail. Yeah. Um, so you are going to talk about hope in this book. There are different demographic uh, sections of the society, right? Yes. So does it does the book also cover is like what was what is the intention or or, or what specific that demographic group was, yes. right? So my question is that, is that section is there in the book? So I think that's a good question. So there is a very specific, uh, there's a chapter on students. Uh, and I think that's the only one that's very specific to the demographic, as you said. The other chapters are more generalized. So there's a chapter on farmers, assuming that, you know, it's farmers across all sizes, uh, across all age groups. Um, but in that, I think there are there's a range of farmers' opinions that are being sort of you know captured. But this chapter on um, you know student protests uh, and students' demands is of course focused on students. Now, of course, you also know that students in this country there's a range you know that goes from eighteen to forty. So you may not sort of think of it as the young group per se, but young enough, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, the chapter on anti-caste protesters, for example, although it draws on historical sort of uh, evidence, but again, many of the protagonists you can meet are very young people, you know, uh, someone like Chandrasekhar Azad Ravan, for instance, uh, he's a young person, you know, I think he's not more than 35, I think, so that's young enough, uh, I think. Now, one of the things that you will see in this book, I'm, I have not relied on direct interviews. Uh, so these are, it's an archive. So it's using existing resources. Uh, and of course the resources, you know, I've used what we have uh, and uh, I've just allocated it according to, uh, you know, across different uh, chapters as is uh, demanded by the focus of that chapter. I want to point to disagree with your uh, point about uh, the nature of democracies. You made a very interesting point, and you're speaking a little bit, where you said that 
democracy is many things, but also convenience and regard of a better identity is one of them. My problem with democracy as it is right now is that it has become a medium of a lot of um, things. And you give me an example. When we think, think about democratic backslide in any country, you think about it in any country, in any geographical context, in any region, the country that uh, you currently live in, you should look at uh, the way the two major political parties are going hammer into office. And Challenge is there is become a mega of consultants. Just last week, we had Daniel Trice, the co author of Spin Dictates. When you read the book, it's anecdote after anecdote about taking up things that ought to be part of citizen welfare scheme, but making them or giving them out in such a fashion. That they look like munitions coming from an emperor. And there's no question. Uh, you don't see people agitating anywhere in the world, be it India, be it Bangladesh, be it Pakistan, be it United Kingdom, where these things are now handed out as if these are some great, very hard things that the prime ministers personally or presidents personally are uh, going and praying under a new tree to get these things done. But look at the preceding two prime ministers in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. They make out <clears throat> every small thing about themselves. If it is uh, Mr. Johnson coming to Gujarat and going to a JCB factory and sitting like a, on a on one of these large yes, yes. trucks. Yeah. We keep on thinking about that democratic backsliding is only happening from one aspect, the government. It's also happening from the other aspect. Your citizen is not interested in content until unless something like a law comes out which really charges a fee. So incremental things they're going down the way. Um, do we vote for in this country? Do we vote for municipality elections? Probably not. Do we care about nobody? So, 19, the, the main, one of the interesting things about doing this on 15th is four days from now, the country is going to vote. It's going to be a, a month and a half long democratic yeah. May now. But that's what it is. It's a May now. Because nobody is reading the election numbers. In a primary stadium setup, it's a Republican presidential yes. election. Yeah. And it's not happening today. It's been happening since 2009. 2004 was the last time that this country apparently went to elections on the merits of Bar members of parliament and parties. We don't. Since 2009, we've been becoming. Uh, a version of an American election. Look at the money that is being spent. Nobody is asking. It's not that we don't know the amount of money that is being spent. But all of us, be it the election commission, be it the, uh, the people in sort of universities and think tanks and civil society, we take it for granted that this is a factor. So when you say that there is hope, that hope is getting fainter by the minute. It's not. Yeah. So I think that's 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 that those are very well point very well taken those points because I think you're right that a lot of the work on democratic backsliding ignores the ways in which socially you know people just let things be let things by. So I think that's a that's a very useful point to um, remind 
us. Although I would say, I think in the Indian context, I don't know about the municipal elections, but people do take part in panchayat elections very actively. They're very, very active in terms of, you know, who the mukhya or sarpanch, etc., will be because they know that it affects their, you know, rural day-to-day, -day, everyday sort of existence. But you're right, that may not translate into uh, a lot of effective uh, oversight over the actual provision of services. Um, but I think on this question of hope to which you bring us back, uh, all of that would have would have been fine to say had we not seen over the last one year or uh, one decade, uh, you, you know, we've seen this country bursting over with, you, you know, people out on the streets protesting, demanding, making claims, despite all the uh, sort of narrative of, and it's not just a figment of people's imagination, as I've said, you know, there's, there's a lot of truth in that. Um, of 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 uh, democratic backsliding. So even if many citizens may just be fine or are letting go or are simply not caring for their government or democracy anymore, the fact is many others are. And we have no way of sort of seeing whether it's becoming, the, that hope is becoming fainter or not. Um, because I suspect that you know, this was probably always the case that, you know, people were, you know, letting their leaders get away with a lot, with, with you know, all kinds of corruption and misgovernance, you know, they, they would let them get away. Although do remember in 2014, of course, when there was widespread accusation and allegation that, you know, across the leadership of the Congress party, there was corruption, you know, we, we saw the results, they were voted out you know, decisively, uh, not only in, uh, in in the Lok Sabha, but also in the Delhi elections um, because of the Commonwealth game scam. And so people do obviously take those seriously. And you're right, I suppose they could take more action in between electoral cycles rather than waiting for elections. But what we've seen in the last 10 years is people not really waiting for elections. In fact, the elections always throw up this paradox of the government being re-elected despite so much protests or so many cycles of protests in between. And maybe, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where the protests are a pressure valve. You, you, you protest, you protest and you sort of get out on the streets, but then you realize that, okay, we can protest against these guys. We don't yet have the collective sort of, you know, numbers to bring an opposition in. Uh, and and that's why we sort of end up with the same, uh, you know, the same. We've ended up with the same government the last two times. Uh, we don't know what will happen after twenty twenty four, obviously. But uh, if all the um, the 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 analysts are to be believed, then the government will be back in sad in the saddle for a third time, which will, I suppose, throw us back to this question. You know, where is you know, for the, for those who might have been hoping that these protests will translate into a change of government, what's going on? And I suppose the protesters will say, we are doing our job, going out on the streets, reminding everyone that, you know, we exist, that alternative views exist, that dissent exists. We are not saying overthrow the government or, you know, overthrow the parliamentary system. We are not Maoists. We are not you know, people who want to sort of over, you know, overthrow the parliamentary form of government. But we are, you know, defending our right to protest and dissent legitimately. So it doesn't answer your question entirely, because I think I would, I, I wouldn't, I would not have the data to sort of see where we were starting out from. But I, I do think that as we stand today, there's there's just so much of effervescence across the country. Um, you know, somebody said India is a cornucopia of protest. It's become a cornucopia of protest since 2014 with the numbers and kinds of ways in which people have put forward alternative views. I mean, one of the chapters uh, talks about the role of comedians, you know, of political humor uh, and uh, artists and the kinds, different ways in which expressions, you know, people have been expressing their disagreement 
is just uh, incredible. Uh, that may not translate into you know a change in government immediately because that you know is, depends on a lot of things. And you could say instead of you know doing a comedy show, why don't people go and make sure that the bureaucrat does something? Uh, but I suppose there are different ways in which people sort of express their, their views. So um, I, I would stop there, but I would say that that doesn't give me reason to not hope. In fact, if anything, the characters you meet in this book, the system work better. Thank you, Professor. Incidentally, I was reading or skimming the book while the CSDS survey is happening. That's right. That's and uh, because I'm an economist, data is always better for me to kind of get into it. Yeah. It's a really good question to, you know, come back to the threefold division that I made earlier between institutions, political actors, and social actors when it came to resisting democratic backsliding. And I think the CSDS data is one very useful data point on this, which shows why institutions, I suppose in some ways, you know, their legitimacy is eroded really and significantly eroded since the last elections here. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, the, um, I think that just goes, you know, comes back to the point about how that may well have left people with no option but to look at these, you know, the charisma, the idea of charisma, the idea, you know, the, the, the powerful uh, politicians who can deliver. And let's be honest, Mr. Modi is not the only charismatic politician around. In the sense, if you look at states, you find you know them around. You know whether it's Bengal, whether it's Tamil Nadu, uh, Delhi's own chief minister. You know before he went into prison, of course he is. He is. You know there was a reason that a lot of people called him Chota Modi, for instance. So in in that sense, I think you're on to something there when you say that there's institutional hollowing out, so to speak, that is happening and has been going on. Um, and although, I mean, it's 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 been there since the 1970s, some would say, but I think, you know, there was some sort of clawing back, some growing back of institution, institutional checks and balances in around 2004 onwards, uh, which is now, again, significantly dwindled down. And I think that's the reason that, you know, for a lot of the hope element uh, one has to sort of turn to, uh, one can't rely on the institutions. And that's, of course, troublesome for any democracy, because democracy is, the institutions do matter to a democracy. I'm not saying it's the only thing that matters, but it does matter. And the moment you have in institutions out and everything else in, it's a very fuzzy sort of thing which can very easily veer on to other kinds of government, uh, you know. So I think we should therefore not let go of those institutions and therefore the tendency your you, the, the CSD DS data points out to is extremely worrying. Um, but I think when you think about hope for democracy lying outside of the, these institutions, that also explains what, why you have that situation where people turn to social actors for hope. Um, and I don't know what the way out here is because of course the institutions are the first places to be colonized as it were. Um, and people who are sort of working up from the bottom, um, I suppose they will you know, find a way to um, reinvigorate those institutions in time but not immediately, because right now they're fighting it out on the social theory, suppose. But your observation is spot on, and I think that's why we focus so much on social actors when it comes to you know defending democracy, because the institutions are uh, clearly have failed the people. You're not very really sanguine and you're not very really hopeful about Mr. Gandhi. That's the sense one gets from reading the book. Well, Did you get into that? Book, okay. I skimmed the book. Because I, feel like I might have missed the context, but I think you were in the, the talk that he gave in Bangalore, if uh, I get the context correctly. And you don't sound very really hopeful or helpful that it's a change. You know? And the reason I'm putting this question is not to put Mr. Gandhi down. The reason I'm asking this question is because at the end of the day, in my 
first question, the presidential system mm -hmm. that we have become. Mm -hmm. You just made a very interesting point in response to my colleague Pardini's question. You say that there are charismatic leaders in Tamil. I presume you are referring to Mr. Star, the chief minister. Uh, Delhi, you're referring to uh, the jail chief minister in the strategic. But they are not in this presidential style. They are not the ones contesting. It's yeah. Mr. Gandhi versus Mr. Modi. And it's been Mr. Gandhi versus Mr. Modi from 2014, 2019, now 2020. And it's just not working. Because Mr. Gandhi, and Mr. Gandhi, to kind of get back to the other thing, enjoy the support of a lot of the actors who have uh, spoken about in the book. And in the, I have no doubt that he must be a genuinely very uh, interested person. But at the end of it all, a democracy can only win if you are elected to power and you maintain a cooling relationship between the state and the union, the federal structure. Uh, you keep a brain on all of these bodies that are under you in different shapes and forms. But if you don't get elected, then people leave you for whatever reason. Yes. Right now, a lot of reasons are offered why people are skipping ship. But one Congress politician who moved over to the region said something very interesting after moving to the region. He said, I'm not moving away for any other reason. There is no corruption charge against me, there is nothing against me. The reason I'm moving is that I'm a politician. I want to win. I want to be in the House of Parliament. And Congress does not offer that hope to me. Mm -hmm. I'm not a social activist. Mm -hmm. And I've been a social activist, I'm going to be very happy. But I'm a politician. Mm -hmm. There are my constituents whose minor and major work have to fall on me. For the last 10 years have been out of power. Mm -hmm. There's nothing I can do as a former member of the parliament. Mm -hmm. So in all of this, the sum total of this uh, question is that what is the hesitancy in projecting all of these other charismatic people that you've got in creating a fund? Because the fund has been created. And if you want to go out, and this is something that I keep on doing, mm -hmm. I ask people who is it that they want to vote for. And it's Mr. Modi because they don't understand who's the candidate on the other side. Is it Mr. Khadri? No, he's ruled out for his age. Is it Mr. Stalin? No. Then it turns out it is Mr. Gandhi, but ostensibly we don't know if it is Mr. Gandhi. Yeah. It's nine, the elections kick off on 19th of April. Yeah. You have no idea who the other side's candidate is. Yeah. And we keep on going back to this simpler time of 2004. So you talk to any politician currently in Congress, and they say, look, we won in 2004 without a candidate. The problem is you did not then have an echo chamber called social media. So you had conventional media, you largely had print media, you had some channels, not a lot of channels. And you control the narrative. Today you can go to social media and the BJP can keep on saying that how can these people leave the country, they can't decide who the prime minister is. And then all of the laundry list of things. Then the second, uh, sorry for the very long, sure. but uh, the second thing is that in 2019, Congress came to the elections, promising them it stood for a long time. In the recent manifesto, the ghost of Nyai has been resurrected, as if we are doing a sort of a country pop version of Hamlet. So you have Nyai over again, now it's in different thoughts. So it's kind of really changed shapes. And Mr. Shekhar Gupta, the editor of print, in 2019 made a comment. He's very reserved, but he put something like this. The people who were beneficiaries of Nyan did not know about it. And people who had to pay for them knew everything. And this time around, he was seeing a reader of that book. So, what does this narrative, social activists 
political parties. Why not I even create a cogent alternative to the ruling party? So I think I'll take that question in three parts, yeah. just following your three parts. And I think the you're you're right that I'm not, I'm not very sanguine about Mr. Gandhi's sort of uh you know the, the alternative that he offers in the present form. And some of it you've already sort of indicated. Um so I'll say a bit about that. Uh, I'll want to say a bit about the tendency to sort of go down the presidential route all over again, because one of the things that often happens is for this to become a presidential contest contest when it is not. Uh, and the third is, of course, to think about future oriented, you know, approaches, things. And, and I think one way in which one of the successes of Mr. Modi has been, and this was most clear in 2014, it's less clear in this election, by the way, but it's very clear, it was very clear in 2014, somewhat around in 2019, there was a future oriented sort of vision plan. It was about infrastructure, it was about development, it was about what we will do for everyone, bring everyone on board. Some of that was repeated in 2019, uh, but you know, there was the usual sort of uh, nationalist rhetoric thrown in. And, and I'm not against nationalism, I consider myself a nationalist as well, but uh, you know, there's, there's a limit to which you can sort of go nationalist or you should go nationalist when it comes to an election. And now, of course, there's a lot of rhetoric about, you know, what people are eating, it's Ravan and uh, Chait and uh, that sort of thing. So which one struggles to understand what the relevance of it is. But I think that's where also that sort of gives you an indication of why I'm not so impressed with the alternative, because when asked with what What's your plan? It is things like Nyai. It is things like, so it's, you know, Garibi Hatao 2.0 uh, or Narega 2.0. I mean, a lot of the people who supported Mr. Modi in 2014 were quite likely to have been beneficiaries of Narega who said, this is a great thing. Thank you very much. But we want now the next step. Narega is great. It has been very good. We don't mean to be ungrateful, but we don't need it now anymore. So you, I, if you keep giving me more of what I don't need, I'm going to get fed up of it, right? Just because it helped me back in the day. It's like, you know, you ask someone, what do you want to eat? And they say rice and dal. And then you say, you keep giving them rice and dal. And, but then they want to now move on to, you know, something else. And you say, but you like rice and dal 10 years ago, but I don't like it today because I want something else. So, you know, it's, I think it's, it's about moving on with what's the next sort of step. And on job creation, for instance, there's a tendency to promise jobs, but um, you know the world of work today and in the next 10 years is going to be very different from the world of work in the last 10 years. And I think this audience knows you know, much better the you know, questions of automation, the questions of artificial intelligence, upskilling, reskilling. Those are the sorts of things that would be much more helpful to focus on. I think some strains of which are in the Congress manifesto that we see now, but they could be propped up more. And they were certainly not there in the London meeting that I attended and which I was, I came away so sort of frustrated because over there it was all about what the family had done for the country and, you know, what, how very Bihatao had been a success and how the BJP was a bourgeois party, and I mean, yes, okay, we we that, that's fine. But what do you what are you going to do next? So, so I think that's 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 the most that's a very straightforward answer to your question. Why not? Why am I? Why I'm not so sanguine? But I'm of course also very worried about this becoming a presidential contest because we are a parliamentary democracy after all, and people should look at the merits of the two political parties and see what's the best thing that can happen. On which, out of interest, there is uh, this long-held uh, belief in the BJP uh, that has been expressed also that no politician should hold public office once they cross 75. Now, of course, we know Mr. Modi turned 75 in 2025. Is he going to continue to be prime minister after that? Flouting their own sort of long-held uh, you know, convention that nobody after 75 should hold position. We don't know. And 
of course, nobody has asked that question either. That question hasn't come up. And I'd be very interested to know what the answer to that is. But Mr. Modi is not going to be around forever, right? So at some point, we will have to think about the merits of the political parties themselves and what they have to offer, uh, which is why uh, the parliamentary system we have, you know, has offers us the opportunity to really look at political parties and politicians from within the political parties, you know, who your own constituency members are. And uh, the argument that uh, is sometimes given by people like what you've said is, yes, they may not, you know, this person who's jumped ship, you know, and I'm, I, I, I'm not judging them for their decisions at all, but they, the party may have lost power, but they could be member of parliament, right? And do their own work. So in the it, because at the end of the day, the parliamentary system is a is you know, the foundation is not the politician at the top, it's the member of parliament. It's the person who's sort of representing you in, in the local constituency. So that work ought to continue. That ought to remain the bedrock of the, the political system and the parliamentary system we have. And and I think that's uh, the, the 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 worry is. And the trouble is that this is the, uh, what we've got the worst of all worlds now. We have the worst of the presidential form. We have the worst of the parliamentary form as well. Whereas we could, we ought to have had the best of the parliamentary system, which is to sort of really look at what the uh, uh, local uh, members of parliament and legislative assemblies are doing and maybe blessed with charismatic leaders. But we seem to have the worst of all. But it brings me back to the third point about. Uh, Yes, we we seem to be sucked down into a presidential system where one party sort of one sort of charismatic leader promises the future, at least talks about 2047, what we will do in 2047, and the other harks back to 1947. And that contrast, I think, is a bit too stark. Now, I think it's probably being a little unfair to pin all the blame down on one individual, you know, because there's a, we know the state of the Congress party itself is not in the greatest health. And um, Mr. Gandhi is probably fighting lots of internal battles in addition to, you know, having to face uh, the, 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 the uh, dominance of the BJP. Um, so hats off to him for being able to do all that as he's able to do and still retain his sanity. Uh, but that doesn't help when it comes to, I suppose, the questions you're asking, which is why the, and I think your, your question about the social actors, the social actors, of course, they, a lot of them support Mr. Gandhi, but I think they also have, have to have the ability to convince him that should a, a broader network or alliance have to be worked out where the Congress party is not necessarily in a leading role, then uh, they should accept it and take a back seat rather than insist that they'll be the ones who will sort of lead it. Um, and that is perhaps where the social actors that we, we, we're talking about could help uh, once, oh, but of course, that's once the results are out. And nobody likes that line of reasoning. Let's see when the results are out because Everyone thinks that's a window for opportunism and corruption. But in a parliamentary system, I think we have to reckon with the uncertainty of what, what the results will throw up. Uh, because if we are certain of what the results will throw up, then I think there's a problem. I mean, we are all certain more or less here, I think, what the results will be. But, uh, you know, institutionally, it's a problem if you know exactly what's going to happen. And so the element of uncertainty is true shape in any parliamentary system or in any democracy, it's crucial. Because remember democracy institutionally is about the right to lose elections uh, and win elections you know, in an uncertain sort of situation. Um, but in the event that you know, we've got an uncertain sort of outcome, then these social actors ought to be able to work with Mr. Gandhi if he doesn't have the numbers well, say okay, take the back seat and see if you can, you know, work with others. So this is the other interesting thing. There's not, there's not a question in Congress because um, if you look at Tamil Nadu, Tamil Nadu is a great state for this. 
Congress, a lot of people forget this. Congress is part of the government. Mm -hmm. So when you think about the government in Tamil Nadu, yeah, yeah. it's underinsured political animal. Only then you know it's DMK and Indian National Congress. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, people think it's DMK's government. Mm -hmm. They are a coalition. Yeah. And yet, DMK has systematically cannibalized Congress's workshop and their workers. You don't have workers on the ground there. The, the crimes of the crime have gone to the DMK. So, you know, it's a very interesting setup yeah. that you talk about. And also, a very important fact that everybody forgets. Epitaphs of the BJP were written in 2004 and 2003. It was done. Something happened between 2009 and 2014. And it was about the feelings. And I think that was because in the opposition and as the opposition, BJP had the ability to surprise the government. In fact, if you look at any new scheme that has come up, BJP keeps on surprising or the ruling government keeps on surprising the opposition even now. And that's something is not right with the very nature of political parties. And I'm a political scientist. Perhaps, <laughs> to the best of my knowledge, there are not good studies. I know that Crystal Chapelot did something on political parties, and there is one book from the 1970s on political parties. But nobody has actually looked at the nature of political parties in 20th century India. It's like a big vacuum. BJP has an office in every district, and every office has a library. They have AV things, and Congress does not have that. Institutionally, something has broken down somewhere. So, I don't know. I mean, this does not seem to be uh, good for democracy. The social actors are important. Yeah. But a democracy can only thrive with parties. No, of course. I mean, I think uh, a no party democracy is not a democracy at all. You know, you have to have um, opposition parties that are able to contest elections and um you know no, hold hold forth yes yeah. absolutely and uh, i mean don't get me wrong the social actors are relevant precisely because of you know the connections you drew earlier with the opposition party so they wouldn't be so interesting if they weren't politically linked up yeah. but but of course what we see is that they are their their uh presence is much more clearer and evident to people than yeah. than that of the of the uh, opposition parties, but I think I think on this uh, the, the the institutionalization or the deinstitutionalization of the Congress Party, <laughs> I think you're right. Part of the the problem <clears throat> with a lot of the state level sort of alliances has been the cannibalization, as you put it, uh, by their own allies, and it's likely that that's a problem that they will continue to have. Um, and if that's really what's going on, then I mean they got, they have to do some serious revamping of their institutional sort of setup, uh, because uh, you know it's it's a it's a, it's a, I guess a corporate question. What's your purpose, and are you fulfilling that purpose? And if others are fulfilling that purpose, then what what is it? What are you good for? Um, it's a it, it's it's always that that election that you said between twenty two thousand nine and fourteen is a very interesting period in India because, and this sort of brings back to the question of emotions, you know, with which we all started. Objectively, India was doing very well. If you look at rates of growth, you know, any economic indicators. So in the West, the usual sort of reasons given for the right, the rise of the right or the rise of identity politics or any of that is to say that, well, the economy was doing badly, working classes were crumbling, they moved right, they elected populist parties, etc. But if you look here, you know, the rates of growth were sort of higher than anywhere in the West. They were less than in the previous era. But, you know, it was a healthy, what, 6%, I think, or, you know, it was, it was 6% I mean, in 2011 was fantastic. If you look at, you know, worldwide sort of rates. And yet there was so much anger among people against the ruling party. 
Uh, and I think it's it's not fair to say it's something that the BJP sort of drummed out of nowhere. You know, there was obviously, you know, something brewing. And, and that's where I think objective and subjective sort of have to be analyzed together to sort of, you know, put so that you understand why there was so much anger despite the economy doing very well or reasonably well. And I suppose that's where the issues of corruption, of nepotism and all of that, you know, sort of help to uh, explain. And why, I mean, recognizing that the Congress party was always like this, what changed in that period is that in some ways the Congress party felt probably victim to its own success because now you had a population that was just much more aware, thanks to their own policies, of what their rights and their sort of, uh, you know, what their entitlements were. And they didn't think they were getting it, uh, and I think it's 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 tragic that the Congress wasn't able to learn lessons from that and really reinvent itself as the party that could say that they were they had created this new middle class. Um, and I'm not saying that the Congress should abandon its sort of commitment to social justice and to the rural poor and uh, those uh, you know uh, marginalized constituencies but to abandon its own contribution to the new middle class that it had to create. It's uh, ridiculous. It's, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, so I, I suppose, I mean, again, that, that sort of a, is a way in which the Congress should probably think about its, the way its own policies created this objective and subjective situation for its own ouster, as it were. Um, and it doesn't answer your uh, question per se, but uh, I think it just gets you to think about the the role of emotions and and interests that the Congress could mobilize. Um, I think the role of social actors is something that, uh, and this book suggests that, of course, you know, it's social actors, democracy, and all of them are linked to the Congress Party, but. Of course, the role of social actors in any democracy is central. I mean, the BJP's entire sort of rise is predicated on social actors through, you know, bodies such as the RSS, for instance, and we cannot ignore that. So in any political sort of setup, especially in ours, uh, the role of social actors is, is absolutely central. And um, although political parties are essential, um, they can't operate without that social foundation, um, which uh, here in our context, you get both in the case of the BJP as well as uh, Congress and others. Um, and I suppose what the BJP has been able to do is to translate its, its social presence into political votes and subsequently the political votes into further social presence. Um, of course, through the digital world. Uh, so it's not just the RSS caps, but also, you know, vast digital presence that it has, which is, uh, which it has done a wonderful job of in terms of just bringing together. And um, I think there's a lot of talk about how many of these accounts are paid for by the BJP and, you know, the BJP does this, that and the other, but lots of academic uh, analysis has showed how these are quite independent accounts, actually. Uh, independent sort of channels who do their own thing and uh, they happen to support the BJP. So they, they're not supporting the BJP because they're paying for it. They're supporting it because that's who they think works. So in that sense, it's a social base that the BJP has, which is quite solid. Mm -hmm.